So we're doing this a bit different this morning. So the kids have gone out first, and we're going to bring them in a bit later. So I'm actually bringing the Word of God now, this morning. Um, yeah, so while you're all awake, the coffee's just hitting a good time to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, so a little bit different, but we're going to go with it, hey, because the Spirit of God moves, whether it's early or later, it doesn't matter. But I do, I do want to start um, with praying this morning. So let's, let's just pray. Father God, we um, just praise you this morning because you are good. You are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. And Father, we just put you in your place this morning as, as head of our lives, as head of our church. And, and God, I just pray that as we open up your word, that it will become so real to us, Father. Living, your living word. And I just pray, God, that the word that is spoken, Lord, are words right out of the heart of you, Father God. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I don't know if you've noticed, but when we're looking at community, our society's taken a bit of a shift. So if you think years and years ago, family, family's still very important to us now, but we used to have multiple generations would often live under the same roof, wouldn't they? And it was very unusual um, for families to live far away from each other. And if they did move out of the home, um, was often very close. We don't often um, hear of that so much these days because our culture now has become a lot more individualistic. We're very good at relying on ourselves a lot more than we used to. And our most regular connections often are the ones that we have in our workplace because we see these people every day and, and it's hard, I think, too, in some ways to, to make a living too, isn't it? So you see a lot of young families having a you know, work as well as do life together. And so often these connections we have are with our work mates. And so these can be, they can be deep, I'm not saying they're not, but often they, they just you know, get to the surface, don't they? They don't go really deep. And we sometimes see this in the church as well. We see this individualism and this almost disconnection often as well. And we hear of many stories where people kind of Serial day churches, you know, come from here and there, and it's quite hard to actually feel safe to connect somewhere and to go deep in a church community. But the truth is, we need each other. And I've come across this week many scientific studies that actually confirm our need to have others in our life. And they actually show, some studies show that having fewer social ties with people is actually associated with more heart disease, cancer, impaired immune function, and longer recovery times from injury, which you believe just having fewer social ties. In fact, research that goes right back into the 1970s actually suggests that people with weaker social networks actually die younger for, for various causes. And people with more extensive, tighter social networks that actually their livelihood is extended. And actually recently, the survival has shown as high as 50% of people that have tight connection with others. So it's scientifically proven that we need connection and we need community for survival. And this week we're starting our series on community. And previous series that we've done with our sermons have probably lasted a few weeks. We're actually going to do this for quite a some time. We're going to try and lead this series right up until we start our Christmas series. So we're going to really delve deep into what God and the Word of God has to say about community. So we're going to have a look in the Bible. And it's amazing, from the beginning to the end of the Word of God, God talks about community. We're going to have a look at that this morning. So we're looking at our church community, us as a body of believers, and how our community fits in and is a part of our broader community and the community that God calls us to minister to. And this is not a new idea. You see, God has always had a community of people. If you go right back in the Old Testament where God had the Israelites, he called them his people. They were his chosen people. And God actually raised them up to minister to the world, to reflect his goodness and, and the power of God to their broader community. And as we go through this series, we're going to have a look at how this applies to us today in our church. And not only has God called us to be together in community, but God's called us to reach our broader community in his name. So we're going to have a look at 
I guess, the, the needs in our community, how we can connect with our community. And we're also going to specifically commit as a church to pray for our whole valley. And this is why we're doing the sermon early this morning, because Matt's going to come in a little while. And something's been on Matt and I's heart recently is just feeling led to really specifically, intentionally pray for our community, for the valley. And so this is what's going to happen this morning. So Matt's going to come in a little while. We're actually going to talk about how we're going to walk through the valley, a prayer walk through the valley. But for those that can't walk, don't worry about that. There's different ways that you can be involved. But um, So Matt's going to come in a little while and we're going to have a look at that. So that's an exciting thing. So as this, um, this morning, what we're going to have a look at is we're focusing on why God's formed us as a community of believers. But I want to focus on something else this morning too, because not only are we a community here in our church, not only are we called to, to witness and share with our broader community, but we actually have a community in our relationship with God, that God is the ultimate community. So I'm going to have a little look at, at that this morning. So I've got three points. Three points, three ways that God shapes us to be a community, and then come up on the screen. God invites us to one, be in community with Him, be in a loving community with God. And the second point is God invites us to be in community with each other, the body of believers. And the third point is that God invites us to be living in as God's community in the world, and then drawing other people to Him. And the key verse this morning, it's going to come up on the screen. And I was wondering if someone in the congregation would actually like to read it out for us. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Would someone just, whoever would like to read that out for us this morning? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Thanks, Judy. So have a look at that first point, that God invites us to be in community with him. So we're going to steal, of course, a little bit. I'm going to talk briefly about the Trinity, but bear with me. So God is a triune God. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're actually a community within themselves. And when we enter into a relationship with God, we are invited to take part in that community, just through relationship. God is a community amongst himself. And God has existed for eternity in community. We were trying to explain to our five-year-old this week how come God wasn't born into the world. Just very confused how God always existed forever. It was, it was very tricky to explain to her. And in fact, we talk about our God as being the Trinity. You see, this means that our God is three, but he's also one. And it's confusing, but it's so profound. You see, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're distinct, but they're intimately connected and in communion with each other. There's one God, but he exists in three persons. And it, it's not meant to be something we can fully understand. Our earthly minds can't, can't quite comprehend that. But that's what's so wonderful about having a faith, isn't it? Believing and having all of this God, this mysterious, wonderful, powerful, all-consuming God. And I actually want to share with you, I came across this painting in actually one of the assignments I've been um, writing my studies. It's going to come up. And I'm not going to too much detail with the painting. So this painting is actually a painting of the Trinity. And it's, it's a Russian masterpiece. And it's actually by um, a painter called Andre Rubio. And the idea is that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, I won't go into too much detail, but they're sitting around in fellowship around a table. And what I loved about this image is they're just, they're three, but they're one. They're sitting together, engaging in fellowship, communing with each other in community. And what's so amazing about faith is when we enter into a relationship with God, we're invited to be equal parts sitting at that table in fellowship. Beautiful image, isn't it? I love that. And with the three, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is a perfect community. They operate as one fellowship. And within God, that is the most perfect example of community that we'll ever find. Imaginable, full of 
a complete and utter love, acceptance, sharing, intimacy, diversity, openness, equality. It's perfect, isn't it? A perfect community. And in creating mankind, God de- desired to invite us to participate and be a part of that community. So all we need to do is respond by accepting that invitation. And when we think of God as community, I'm going to look more practically now. I've actually got a, um, a model of a healthy community, another pie graph coming up. It's take, taking a bit of a shift here. It's actually a lot more practical, this one. So this is just a healthy community model. Because if a community looks healthy, it covers these four things. Intimacy, you know, knowing and being known. We don't need that. Don't need diversity. Difference is welcomed. Openness, there's room and space for all. Equality, knowing fear as superior beings. And if we're looking at our God as the ultimate community, if you look at that, we find limitless amounts of these four things in Him, don't we? God, the ultimate community. So in relationship with Him, we have an overflow of everything we need. Intimacy, equality, diversity, openness, you name it, we have it in Him. And so the second point this morning I want to have a look at is that God invites us into a community with each other. You see, he didn't create us to be in community with just God, with him alone. See, God created Adam initially, and God, we're looking at God as a perfect community. Adam could have found everything that he needed in God, in his relationship with God. But God said in Genesis 2, 18, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So God created man and woman to be in community with each other, created marriage, families, to live together and to bear this image of them, reflecting this community of this all-encompassing God. And this impacts not just man and woman, but it's all human interactions. God's intention for us is to be in community. We're never meant to do life alone. The writers of the early church say this, James 5.16 says that therefore confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has a great power as it's working. I've got several other examples here. Galatians 6.2 says where to carry each other's burdens. Romans 12.13 and Hebrews 13.16 say care for each other's practical needs. First Thessalonians 5, 14, warn each other of sin. And then Romans 12, 15, rejoice and mourn with each other. It's everywhere, a lot more examples where that came from. And then later on we actually see this continue. After Adam and Eve, God formed a larger community. I mentioned this earlier, that God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people. God's presence was to live among the Israelites. Leviticus 6, chapter Leviticus 26, verse 12 says, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. You see, the Israelites, they lived and worshipped God together in community. But as we see all through the Old Testament, this was imperfect. This community was imperfect, and the nation kept rebelling, turning away from God. God came in, he picked up the pieces, he restored And what did the Israelites do? They mucked it up again. (laughs) This vicious cycle just occurs the whole way through the Old Testament. And so this wasn't this perfect community that God had designed. So God restored things through Jesus Christ. And Jesus then invited us through his death and resurrection back into that community with with God through himself. And this is a beautiful picture here because The Bible explains that this new type of community that we've found through Jesus, it's in John chapter 15, because it says, talks about us being grafted into his life, just like a plant. And the difference with this community is that instead of being with God or being near God, we're actually invited to be in God. It's a deeper connection. As it says that we, he is the vine, we are the branches. And what that means is that this community relationship allows us to receive life from the vine. We're connected. We're connected in community. It's beautiful, isn't it? 
So following the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ, God then instituted the church again. We, we did a series of the, the early church, the Acts church, didn't we, together as, as a church here. And God instituted the church to be a community of believers, to bring him glory and to bring other people into, into relationship with Christ. First Corinthians, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. In Romans we read, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, the many, are one body in Christ and individually members one another. We are better together. It's just a little analogy. We are um, doing a bit of a move around our bedroom recently and we rearrange things. We often joke about both being officers' kids, how we get after about two years, we have to rearrange our house. <laughs> Praise the Lord, we're staying for another year here. But we have to rearrange our house. <laughs> we can't help it. So we rearrange our bedroom and our wall was really bare. And there's only so many photos one house can have of three children. I'm trying to limit photos all over the walls. And I thought I want an artwork or something to go up on the wall. And I was thinking about it. And I came across these two um, images, we end up just printing them ourselves and I framed them and they're just two words written in font and the two words are better together yeah. and they're framed and we've got them up over our bed and we often joke Matt and I about how different we are as people and it's funny we've gone to several um, leadership courses where we've done our leadership styles, our personality traits, our spiritual gifts and we laugh because without fail if there's a pie graph, if there's um, something to measure by. If you find that on this side, I will be as far on this side as you can get. And we we'll often joke that he's the brains of the operation, but I'm the heart of the operation. But what I love about that is if I'm to make decisions or to respond from my heart and my feelings every time, I lack the wisdom that I need. The wisdom that Matt speaks into my decisions. So God knew that we were better together, didn't he? And that's us as a church. We're better together. It says it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9, verse 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift them up. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, Two will withstand him. A three-fold cord is not quickly broken. So don't have the importance of living as a church community. What is the church community to look like? First Peter chapter 2 verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We as individuals are to be living stones, all of us together being built together. And the term spiritual house refers to a temple or a building where God lives within, so where God dwells. So God's plan for us was to be individual living stones that he builds together to be a temple that he lives within. And I love how the phrase is actually written in present tense being built. We're not already built into what God wants us to be. We are being built into these, this spiritual house by being living stones. And I think it helps to visualise a wall. Like we've got beautiful brick walls here in our church. We think every brick in a wall has a, st a brick above it, a brick below it, either side of it, holding it together. If one gets loose, more often than not, you're going to have issues around, aren't you? And you can't pull out a brick without the whole wall being affected. And I'm encouraging us this morning, are we so built into the lives of a body of believers that if we stopped coming, it would collapse? We're supposed to share everything in community. We're meant to be built together, interlocking. And not only is doing life in community, um, support us, it actually brings us closer to Christ because we learn from each other. We can't actually know everything there is to know about God just by doing, doing it ourselves, doing faith journey by ourselves. I don't know about you, but I've learned so much in my journey 
in faith by hearing other people's stories. Because my journey is my journey, but someone else's journey may impact mine or may, may shed light into something that I haven't experienced. We learn and grow from each other. Hebrews chapter 10, it's going to come up on the screen, says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day growing near. So then I ask this question. Why are we to be built into a community here? Have you ever wondered if God intends us, and looking at the first point about how God wanting us to be in an intimate community and relationship with Him, why doesn't He just take us up to heaven now and then we'll be there? Yeah. We'll be there in that relationship that, that is promised us. And this is where we come to this third point this morning. You see, we're invited to be a living community in the world, God's living community community in the world. And this is the same reason all through the Old Testament, but we see this expressed most clearly in that verse that Judy read, the verse of Judy read us this morning. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light, into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our calling as a community is to live in a way that invites others into community with him. Second Corinthians, got lots of scripture this morning. <laughs> Very exciting. Second Corinthians chapter five. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. That's key. We are Christ's ambassadors. So we get this, don't we? That God's called us first and foremost into communion with him, communion with each other, and communion with others. But then there's a challenge here too. And we often forget, and I think this is what stumps us up so many times, that there is an enemy that is actively trying to work against our sense of community. He wants us to do life alone. And I want to read you this beautiful quote. It's from a book. He says, Satan wants to destroy our community and isolate us. And Paul Tripp, in his book, Wider Than Snow, Meditations on Sin and Mercy, so this is going to come up on the screen. It's beautiful. And it sums this up perfectly. There it is. Thank you. We weren't created to be independent, autonomous, or self-sufficient. We were made to live in a humble, worshipful, and loving dependency upon God, and in a loving and humble interdependency with others. Our lives were designed to be community projects. I love that. Yet the foolishness of sin tells us that we all that we have all that we need within ourselves. So we settle for relationships that never go beneath the casual. We defend ourselves when people around us point out a weakness or a wrong. We hold our struggles within, not taking advantage of the resources that God has given us. And so there's three things this morning I'm touching really briefly to finish, but I want us to look at three lies that we often fall into believing about community. So remember these are lies, okay? <laughs> And the first one is that we can do life alone. Hence, this week we celebrated Are You OK Day, a day designated for suicide awareness. We're not supposed to do life on our own. Second one, that we can live our faith by ourselves. Proverbs 27, 17 contradicts this perfectly. Iron sharpens iron, just like another person should sharpen another person. One man sharpens another. And the third lie that we often believe is that we can isolate our church community from the world. And I think we sometimes get trapped a bit with that verse that God calls us to be in the world and not of it. And I think sometimes we get, and you know, I struggle with this, do we get fearful of the things that are in the world to the point where sometimes we don't actually, many Christians don't actually allow themselves to be in the world. We've got to be in the world to make a difference in the world. So society, society may tell us 
We can't do life on our own, but God's word tells us over and over again that we simply can't function without each other. So here's the bottom line this morning, those three points. One, we need to be in community with God. We need to be in community with each other. And we need to be living as God's community in the world. And this morning, I guess, um, you know, in putting an application together in it, in us trying to take out what God's saying to us, I want to encourage you this morning, when we're talking about being living stones and having God build us into a temple, the temple that he can use, you see, we can't, we're no good as living stones if we're not connected to the cornerstone. And I think out of all those three points this morning, to be in loving community and relationship with Christ has to come first and foremost. And I want to encourage you of that this morning. You see, once we're connected to the cornerstone, once we're connected to our Heavenly Father, living in a healthy community as a church, living in a healthy just being Christ community out in the world, that's going to happen. That will be a natural occurrence if we are living in an intimate relationship with Christ, in communion with this holy God. And um, you might wonder why we've got all these rainbow blocks at the front. <laughs> And um, I was trying to look for more subtle building blocks. <laughs> so they're building blocks. And I think what's key is I'll bring some up here. And what's key with whether it's a Lego or whether it's blocks that you often see children building with is you can't just stack them on top of each other. See? Unless what's going to make them stay, they've got to click in. So they've actually got to be connected. In order for something to be built out of it, they've got to lock in, they've got to interlock with each other. And what you'll also find is, particularly with smaller Lego, is that kids can build something. I see with my children all the time, they'll build something, but if it's not connected to a base board holding it in, it might fall or it might break. And um, we couldn't find one big enough, but I've done the best I can at the front and connected a few together. And that kind of this morning symbolises the cornerstone. If we're to be living stones for Christ in this community, we need to be connected to the cornerstone. And um, this morning, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find it actually helps me to respond practically sometimes to sermons or it helps me to respond to God. And maybe God this morning is asking me, just to be more connected, whatever that looks like for you. And maybe this morning he's actually asking you to step in for the first time into a relationship with him and to get that right. And, um, yeah, I'd love to pray. I'm going to invite the team to come up now. And I'd love if you would like some prayer this morning, um, please come. Not only there's Nat and I, I'd love to pray for you. We've got a spiritual leadership team available for prayer um, if you need prayer this morning. But if it would help, um, I encourage you this morning, if you'd like to just to come and take a block and actually connect it to the cornerstone, or you can even connect it to someone else's building block, um, just as a sign to say, God, I, I want to be in a loving community with you, I want to be in a loving community with my church, and I want to be your living community here on this earth. So, yeah, if that helps this morning, come and